Welcome to Reasons for the Hope. In today's episode, we'll be talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses. There is a high probability that your door has been knocked by people sharing the good news, at least once, especially if the Jehovah's Witnesses live within your community. In today's episode, with me is a very close friend and special guest, Derek Burris. Derek, how are you doing? Doing great, Jair. Awesome. So as we are about to go through this topic, our audience will very likely want to know why I have brought you to this episode. Now, I have mentioned this on our Facebook page uh, to the people of Life Church in St. Peter's uh, that I was gonna, we were going to be doing this uh, the series on the Jehovah's Witnesses and that I had a friend that... Uh, has been working on uh well you finished it i believe the master's uh a degree in, the in theology and that you were also a former jehovah's witness so there is a lot that you can bring to to this topic and i'm very excited to to go through it with you um do you want to say a little bit more about your background and and why you think this topic is important Well, it is very important, Jair, because like you said, they're going to be contacting you. And the question is, uh, what kind of involvement are you going to have and, and what kind of dialogue? Um, now, my background is, like you said, I was a Jehovah's Witness and I do have some um, training now in theology. But apart from that, I wasn't just your ordinary Jehovah's Witness. Um, I was deeply involved in it. Um, I even worked at their headquarters as a young man. I was a full-time evangelist. Um, conducted a lot of home Bible studies. I'm very familiar with their their publications and the texts they use to prove their points, their uh, and just their their views. It was my life for much of my uh, life up till I was the age about 29. Um, I became, got saved, born again, in uh, 2004, um, just really a couple of years before I met you, and. Um, I want to say that too, that, you know, my primary um, qualification here is that I'm a Christian. Um, I, I approach this from, you know, what is Orthodox belief? Um, and also I'm trying to look at it in an objective sense. Um, as you know, when you first met me, I was studying math and that was really something I was doing in one way because You know, I wanted to think clearly and logically about life and religion and everything and science. And so I really have a desire to be objective. Um, same thing with theology. You know, there's so many views on things that, and the Jehovah's Witnesses raise a lot of issues about what what is truth. And they really don't uh, think too highly of any other religious group outside their organization. So, you know, I'm not really anti-JW. I love the Jehovah's Witnesses. I love them as people, um, but um, I have to say that I, I have some problems with the things they're teaching as a Christian and as a person who wants to think logically. I can't say I always think logically, but I, I want to just distinguish myself from those who they would call apostates, um, or you might say an anti-Jehovah's Witness activist. I don't really have an ax to grind here. I'm not sitting around thinking about them all the time. Um, I've done a lot of research on it in becoming the person I am today, but I would really just like to see Christians um, have a better dialogue with the Jehovah's Witnesses. If they are going to talk to them, at least they have a little information about their history, their, their beliefs, what they're really aimed at doing, and that sort of thing. Well said, well said. So, um, wow, there's a lot in here that you've been involved throughout your your life, uh, especially as a Jehovah's Witness. That I'm, I'm excited to keep hearing about. Um, and there is this one uh, uh, thing I want to highlight, which can be uh, summarized into you and I both share the same feelings for equipping uh, the Christian community. And well, that's part of why this ministry was created, Reasons for the Hope helping out uh, local churches and, and uh, anywhere that this episode and our podcast can reach, uh, you know, understanding this. And I, I don't see very many podcasts on the Jehovah's Witnesses, so I think this is going to be really good. 
Um, so can you tell us uh, a little bit about the history of the, the JWs, which is abbreviation for Jehovah's Witness? And uh, I believe you've mentioned to me on our personal talks um, what, what is called a watchtower. Can, can, you, can you expand on that? Yes, sir. Uh, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, don't really claim too much affiliation with any group. So, you know, if you look at their publications, you're not going to say, you're not going to hear them saying, yes, we uh, are, we got our ideas from this group over here or that. They, they tend to discount that. But, uh, you know, if you're looking at it from a, the, the vantage point of a church historian, or even just a, maybe if you were a sociologist looking at developments within religion, you're going to see that they can certainly be tied to other groups in the 1800s when they emerged. And so there were groups that were looking at when Jesus would return. And there were other groups in a broader sense that were trying to restore Christianity to its pristine condition, assuming that things had been corrupted, the teachings had been corrupted, the practices, whatever. And so if we look at this first kind of strain of uh, waiting, thinking Jesus is going to return, um, then we would look at the Millerites. William Miller is the man to research there. Um, he taught that Jesus would return in 1844, the rapture would occur, didn't happen. Um, so that led to what historians call the Great Disappointment. After that time period, some people began to theorize that Jesus had actually returned invisibly. Sounds very convenient, doesn't it? Yeah, indeed. <laughs> but um, so other people picked up on that. The Seventh-day Adventists did and uh, the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses did later. So um, they, they claim that Jesus coming or his presence occurred invisibly at one time or another. So um, the other movement that we, you could check out is this restorationism, and, and that's a little broader. So, you know, you might look at like the Mormons, um, the Disciples of Christ, like I said, the Adventists, and, you know, some strains of Pentecostalism can, can really have this idea in them that there was so much that was corrupt within the institutions of Christianity that they now represent the true uh, followers of Jesus. Now, I think we ought to distinguish that, you know, if you look at the church as an organism rather than an institution, and we say we're all imperfect and God's using people everywhere, that kind of puts a lid on a lot of the, that talk. But basically, um, Charles Taze Russell appears in the 1870s, and in um, 1877, he predicted that the end of the Gentile times would occur in 1914. Now, briefly, that, that Gentile times was just uh, his way of saying that man's rulership over the earth would end um, and Jesus would take dominion. So they did expect Jesus to visibly return at that time point. But then when that didn't happen, he did the same thing that some of these other people had been doing, like Ellen G. White and, and some of the disappointed people that followed William Miller. And they said, well, he invisibly returned. Now, that's something that maybe not a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses know that they had changed that. But that's exactly what happened. And that can be documented by looking at some of their older publications and the things Russell actually wrote. Russell died in 1916 and another man took over and there was quite a bit of uh, upheaval there. You might say that uh, this man instituted a coup. His name was Joseph Judge, nicknamed Judge Rutherford. And at that point, the people who were loyal to Russell uh, fell away and formed their own religion. And uh, under R Rutherford, some really drastic things happened and where the doctrines of, uh, of the followers of Russell or this new institution that would become known as the Jehovah's Witnesses emerged. And, you know, they, they stopped teaching that men should be born again. Um, they taught that uh, people are going to go to heaven. 
and they they claim that those people uh, prior to this year 1935 when the, these real big changes came they they were really anointed but from there on out God was just looking for followers he was looking for people to follow the organization that had he had put his seal on so Rutherford died in 42 and you know there were some other presidents that came along and nor Nathan nor was one of them um, in the 1960s they began teaching that 1975 the, uh, Jesus would return that didn't happen either um, and then we get down to the 1980s and there was another big upheaval and in that one uh, this this man named Raymond Franz who was a very influential leader um, had uh, uh, left and he wrote a book about a lot of their failed predictions and his involvement within the organization and that earned him the label the evil slave uh, which is a they pulled out from Matthew 24 as well um, so the the watchtower the organization that runs the Jehovah's Witnesses they claim that their leaders are the faithful and discreet slave class that is that they are appointed by Jesus to be his channel for dispensing spiritual food when this man Raymond Franz went against them they said well he's he must be the evil slave who beats the servants and um, Jesus is not very happy with that obviously Wow there there is so much history here uh, uh, Derek that uh, I'm very glad you have researched all of this but so, so let me just ask you this real quick so they they had it twice wrong correct oh much more than that <laughs> uh, in Franz's book it's called crisis of conscience um, and really it's just duplicating you know um, past watchtower magazines it's not like he's just coming up with this stuff on his own but he shows that they I think it's about six dates they pro they've uh, predicted or suggested that Jesus might return so you, you know like 1914 1918 1922 I don't know all of them but 1914 wow. and 1975 are the big ones um, they don't want to talk about any of them other than 1914 because they think that Russell did get that right in saying that something significant would happen in 1914 and since World War I started they said well he was right he was right. The devil was cast down from heaven in 1914, and something there must have been something spiritual going on. So, wow, this is incredible. Very rich history, and I'm sure you're just kind of sketching the surface as you say. <laughs> sure. yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And uh, I was wondering. So, uh, is was there anyone? Was there any notable people uh, that you know of at all, the top of your head? that were challenging these movements as they got it wrong. Well, the thing about that is that um, for the most part, you know, they they exercise a lot of control over their adherence. So to, to speak out against it is, is um, you know, it's like questioning Jesus, you know, I mean, it's it's mm. very serious. So, it, um, and again, Franz document, documents this because after they were wrong, they always said, well, we just suggested that date, or we just thought it might be, um, it might happen. But in reality, if you were, if you, let's say you lived in the 1960s and you said, you know, I don't, I don't think the chronology is right, or the way you're coming up with this 1975 date is really right, then, then you would have been dismissed and, you know, shunned by all the other Job's witnesses. And, and he, you know, he explains how, that really did happen and I, I've seen that in my life John too in fact I you know I uh, that is the reason I left the Jehovah's Witnesses because I no longer believe their doctrines about 1914 right so that sets us up sets us up for the next uh, portion of, of this episode so what what are the implications of what you've said and uh, you know what what it would be what would be noteworthy uh, for Christians today about this information and the history you have just shared with us Sure. Well, one big thing we ought to learn is that the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Watchtower today are much different than their original founder, Charles Taze Russell, envisioned the people of God to be. 
Uh, that's because of Rutherford. Rutherford changed many of the doctrines. Uh, among those are Christ's deity. They, they do not believe Jesus is God. They believe he's just um, a created being. Uh, they don't believe that Jesus died on a cross. So they find that idea repugnant. They think he just died on a stake. Uh, they don't believe in Christmas, uh, that, that that's honors God. Uh, we talked about their earthly hope and not believing in going to heaven, which is, you know, we find that in the New Testament, uh, talking about uh, being with Jesus or seeing him face to face or, you know, many references that if you read through Paul in the New Testament is about, hey, you know, we're going to be with Jesus someday. So th those are all things that we can see significant without getting too much into all their doctrines. Uh, but those things are uh, more representative of, of uh, Rutherford's changes that he made. Russell believed all those things. He believed in the cross. They used to have a little cross pendant they put on their lapel and they believed Jesus was God and they celebrated Christmas there at the headquarters. Um, but they, they felt they had to separate. So that's one thing to note. Second thing is <clears throat> that, it, you know, if Russell was right about something, it was simply that 1914 was a significant year. However, um, if he was wrong about so many other doctrinal matters, it raises some big questions about the legitimacy of the organization that he founded. And especially as, as it, uh, you know, as it being an exclusive vehicle for dispensing uh, spiritual truth. You know, if the Jehovah's Witnesses have continued in their teachings of, if they would have continued in their teachings of Russell and admitted that his prophetic guesswork was wrong, we would find more parallels uh, with the Seventh-day Adventist and the teachings of Ellen G. White. But instead we see him as some sort of, uh, you know, they want to see him as some sort of prophetic figure even if they don't like to use that title, while they're, they're still, uh, you know, eschewing the uh, doctrines he held in common with Orthodox Christian belief. So, you know, it's just highly problematic along those lines. Um, the Jehovah's Witness teaching that the year 1914 marked the end of the Gentile times. You know, it's a core doctrine for them um, to deny it as apostate and uh, their exclusive claims to being God's people led by this faithful and discreet slave of Matthew 24, 45 is based on Russell's 1914 prediction. Now, the great difference between the Jehovah's Witnesses and a group like the Seventh-day Adventists, it's observed that by noting their claims to exclusivity, the Seventh-day Adventist church does not claim that kind of exclusivity. They celebrate much more of Christian history and they do teach the gospel of grace. So this is probably why the late great uh, Christian apologist Walter Martin did, didn't classify the Seventh-day uh, Adventist church as a cult in his work, Kingdom of the Cults. But, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses are very anti-Christian. They're teaching that Christendom is the most reprehensible part of what they think of as Babylon the Great in the book of Revelation. It's a denunciation of all other Christian groups as satanic and God dishonoring. The churches for them are lurking places for demons. So, you know, there is a huge glaring problem with all of this rhetoric on their part. And it's that their intellectual dishonesty in promoting their sect is exceeded only by misreading and selectively reading the history of the church in ways that distort the truth. It's all part of their agenda to make a wholesale condemnation of any group of people who claim to be Christian. But if they have not been honest about their own history, why should we think that they will be honest about more obscure matters of the past? I see, Derek. And you know, one one thing as you you're mentioning all of this that I that you know put a thought on my mind. So you mentioned uh, the Seventh Day Adventists too in here, and in the word cult. So as we're talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses, so would you say they are a cult of them? You know, I don't use that term too much. I just did reference uh, Walter Martin's work, Kingdom of the Cults. But you know, I think a person ought to know what that means before they just start throwing it around. Right. But, and basically. That, that word is 
is used to, it can be used in a lot of different ways. Apologists are usually using it to describe something that is a non-Christian group. Um, a, you know, so they look at Christianity in a really wide sense, and then they say, so what groups have totally uh, abandoned the faith and have started to teach something different? So I would say, in, if you look at it that sense, you know, you're going to separate that from a, a sect. A sect is a group that, that may be orthodox enough, but they do separate themselves and they don't celebrate the diversity of thought or, you know, that there are different Christians with different points of view on uh, what Paul is talking about, you know, debatable matters, things that we ought to just respect other people's views on and not uh, get too upset. I see. But, but it sounds then that definitely these this groups, um, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, would be groups that started out with some sort of Christian background, and then through that, they have perhaps um, misinterpret uh, things in Scripture uh, or, or, or things in history. Does that sound fair? Yes, there there is a um, a lot of misinterpreting of history that goes on, and you know, just maybe for one quick example would be if you look at the Emperor Constantine. You know, he certainly is a controversial figure in history when you consider the birth of um, Catholicism and the growth of the Church out of the Roman Empire. But you know, his function within the Jehovah's Witness reading of Church history cannot be overstated uh, more than any other individual. They they lay the um, paganization of Christendom at his feet. Yet I was surprised when when I was studying for my master's, I did my own research on this master, uh, on this matter and wrote uh, a paper on the subject. But I found out that the Watchtower consistently uh, misrepresented his role in the Council of Nicaea. You know, they portray his pagan influence as the cause behind the Trinity Doctrine being established at the Council. but. Uh, in fact, historians, historians note that Constantine established the general principle of ecumenical councils, not emperors uh, being the ones to settle doctrinal disputes. He was he was very uh, hands off, at, especially at the beginning. And I think that um, you know there was a huge council there, and they voted and everything. It wasn't him just um, laying down the law and saying let's all paganize Christianity. Wow, you know we're getting our our feet really wet with all this uh, rich history and, and and what it all entails uh, on the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, there's one thing as we're as we're getting to a to a wrap in here. Uh, you may you mentioned ecumenical councils, uh, not emperors, should settle doctrinal disputes. So I was curious uh, that how, if you could briefly, how are other I guess branches of Christianity, wh whether they be Catholics or or Protestant, how have they viewed the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, over time? If you could say something about that before we go on to close, you know, I think that especially like if you look at the Vatican II Council, right in the 1950s, the Catholic Church basically said we accept all these Protestant peoples. You know, it was like what 400 years now, right? But you know they they are christians and we accept their baptism as valid you know but they still say you should be part of the catholic church and you know that's there is much more um liberality in terms of who we accept as christians and in, in what i would think of as the body of christ but by the same token if you go across all these groups who have more of a um, you know, a friendly disposition toward other Christians, you would still see that most of them will tell you, but the Jehovah's Witnesses do not represent the faith. And that is because they they have um, abandoned what we call core doctrines of the faith. And I know we're getting to probably something we're going to talk about later, but the, you know, the gospel, the, the identity of Christ, something like the Trinity, um, they're just core things that a broad spectrum of Christians say you can't mess with that. If you mess with that, you don't have Christianity anymore. That is right. Well, 
That sounds like a very great introduction for a first episode, Derek. Thank you so much for your time. And for our audience, please subscribe to the channel if you want to continue to listen to Derek. Uh, we're going to have a, a few more episodes on, on this uh, on this topic. Uh, we want to be equipping the Christian community to be able to handle and to demolish arguments like Scripture says. Uh, and uh, everything with gentleness and respect. Thanks again, Derek. And... Uh, If you guys have on the audience uh, any questions, uh, we will leave our email address on the description of the channel uh, for, for this episode. And if you have any questions in particular for Derek, go ahead, write us up. We will share with him and I'm sure he'll be glad to uh, reply back. Right, Derek? Sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I will see you on the next episode.